Welcome to the next level, conversations that propel business. The next hour is all about the entrepreneur, why they start businesses, how they make their businesses grow, how they overcome failures and achieve success. Your hosts are Bob Gibbons, founder of Riata Commercial Realty, a commercial real estate advisory and tenant advocacy firm, and Stephen Nooner, founder and CEO of Alkali, a company with a unique process that helps businesses more effectively buy and manage their insurance programs. Bob and Stephen will ask probing questions to find impactful solutions that will help take your business to the next level. And now, here's Bob Gibbons and Stephen Nooner. Welcome to the Next Level, Conversations That Propel Business. I'm your host, Stephen Nooner. And this is Bob Gibbons, and we have another great show today, and I'm particularly excited about this show because Chad Hauser is our guest today. Chad is with Cafe Momentum. He's the founder, CEO, and executive chef, and I've known about Chad for a while. He doesn't know I've known about it. I'm gonna, he's going to think I'm a stalker, exactly. Your living room furniture <laughs> looks amazing. <laughs> 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 no, I've, I've read about Cafe Momentum for quite a while. I went to the uh, the duets thing that the uh, Dallas Morning News did, and uh, I've been to the to the uh, cafe and had dinner there with my son and his girlfriend and my wife, and that was great. So I've seen it, and so I've been excited to try and get you on the show, so we're glad you're here today. And uh, so Cafe Momentum, I love the tagline, taking kids out of jail and teaching them to play with knives and fire. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. There's a lot that we have to talk about to explain that. But Chad's been uh, recognized nationally as a CNN hero. Uh, he's been in way too many things for me to talk about. So many awards, 40 under 40, top 50 under 40, 30 most interesting people in the metro area. That's a pretty high bar. And uh, on and on. But I'm not going to do all that because it'll take the whole time. So welcome, Chad. We're glad you're here. Welcome. Thank you, guys. I was uh, also super stoked because um, probably about two weeks ago, I wasn't familiar with Cafe Momentum, but two weeks ago I was having dinner with a good friend of mine who will be left unnamed, but it's a mutual friend of Bob's and mine. You know who you are, Jeff. And <laughs> 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 he literally, he saw you so, talk somewhere, and he said it literally, uh, it, it changed the way he thought about his business, and it, al- it like almost almost moved him to tears. Wow. You're welcome, <laughs> Jeff. Yeah, it's not often I can say I make a grown man cry. <laughs> Bob does it every day. <laughs> well, we like to start off with wisdom of others. Do we have some wisdom today, Stephen? We do. Um, we have a quote that Chad provided. It says, people that actually solve problems very rarely complain about them. Why, who said that? Because uh, I was curious about that, and why do you like it? You know, I have no idea who said that. Um, an, uh, a customer at a my old restaurant um said that one day, and this was probably 10 years ago, and it has stuck with me. I think about it every day um, because I think it's true. We can sit and complain all day long, but that doesn't ever actually fix what you're complaining about. Right. Mm-hmm. You just got to you know, roll up your sleeves and get your elbows dirty, and that's how you actually um, solve the, the issue that, that you're complaining about. Yeah. I'd rather somebody come to me with a solution than a problem. Absolutely. That's one of our philosophies at Cafe Momentum. Don't come to me with a problem. Come to me with a solution. Yeah, excellent. T- tell me, you, can, uh, you can tell me what the issue is, but tell me how you're going to fix it. Don't look at me expecting me to fix it for you. Reverse delegation? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you're, you're trying to fix a really big problem, so that's got to be a, a big thing. But before we get into all that, let's, let's kind of go back a little bit and give us a little more uh, context of your background. <laughs> I know you went to El Central College. I for did. your uh, culinary training. I did. I did. Prior to that, um, I, I grew up wanting to be the next Dale Hansen. Uh, when I was in eighth grade, really? I, I, when I was in eighth grade, I actually wrote him a letter asking him if I could shadow him for a day. And he um, called me out of the blue and wow. said, absolutely come down. Uh, and I, I followed Dale Hansen around for a day. And there were two, two great uh, stories that came out of that. The first one is... Um, Dale sh- told me to show up at the WFAA studios at 8 o'clock. I mean, uh, 4 o'clock, Channel 8. Yeah, I was going to uh, say, it's Dale Hansen. Yeah. <laughs> no told morning. me to show up at uh, 4 o'clock, which, of course, I thought, oh, my God, he doesn't even come to work till 4. That's amazing. <laughs> I really wanted to be him. Um, so I was there promptly at 4 o'clock, and Dale wasn't. Um, because he wasn't, I had to sit in the lobby waiting for him to show up. And while I was sitting in the lobby, the doors opened and out walked a gentleman by the name of Walter Cronkite. Oh, wow. And I got to meet um, the legend, 
Walter Cronkite, which was really, really neat. The second thing, um, not quite as, as monumental, but Dale told my mom that if I could stay for the 10 o'clock newscast, uh, he would take me to Hooters for dinner. <laughs> and and um, my mom picked me up at 6.32 as soon as the 6 o'clock <laughs> newscast <laughs> cast ended. And you've never been to Hooters since. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but I, I just, and, and that, that just spurred, um, the enthusiasm. I, uh, went to college still wanting to be the next Dale Hansen, ended up taking, um, a literature course and reading the Welsh poet, uh, Dylan Thomas and became so fascinated by this man that, um, I went to my parents after two years of college, um, was transferring to the university of North Texas, um, and told oh, my parents agree. I was going to get, yeah, I was going to get a degree in English literature. Um, but that as soon as I graduated, uh, I was going to go cook, um, because I loved cooking. Um, I was, I, I loved the creativity in cooking. I love cook my, I love the camaraderie that comes with sitting around a table and eating together. Um, and my dad, um, promptly said, well, if you love cooking so much, then why don't you just go to culinary school? Which, uh, if you know my extremely conservative father, you know that the idea that he would tell me to forego four-year university, um, which was mandatory growing up, um, <laughs> to go to culinary school was about the equivalent of him telling me, um, here, son, let me give you a couple hundred bucks to buy a van. Just throw your guitar in the back and tour the country. You can do it. You know, rock and roll. Um, and so I went I, – I, I promptly enrolled in El Centro. Um, and, and, and I guess the rest is, is, is history, so to speak. Now, El Centro has a, a pretty well-recognized culinary school, doesn't it? Very well-recognized. I remember one of the students bringing a report when I was there, um, which was mid to late 90s, um, that it was like ranked one of the top five culinary schools really? uh, in the country. Yeah. Wow. That's awesome. That is awesome. So, And they've put out a lot of people that are pretty well-known now. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think there's a there's a veritable who's who of, of Dallas chefs, uh, Jamie Sanford, Mark Castle, Janice Provo, who is my former business partner at Parigi. Um, the list goes on of some incredibly um, Dunia Borga from La Duni, uh, an incredible list of successful restaurateurs that wow. went through El Centro. So you change paths, right? Yep. And then you <laughs> go from from that and then. How do you go into your first business, your first restaurant? Um, I uh, had been cooking for about 10 years. Um, so for all the Malcolm Gladwell fans out there. The Tipping point, <laughs> yeah. 10,000. <laughs> 10, 10, 10 years, 10,000 hours. Although I think in the restaurant industry, 10 years is about 20,000 hours. Right. <laughs> you only worked 1,000 So maybe hours I was a, a little slow. <laughs> um, uh, I had a, an opportunity to... Uh, buy an ownership stake in Parigi Restaurant. It was around 2008. Um, I sold my house, took out all the equity out of it, uh, wow. and then took out a, a, a personal loan uh, and bought into Parigi. Of course, my favorite uh, anecdote about that is that um, bought into the restaurant and the economy immediately tanked. <laughs> 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 Restaurants were closing left and right. And I remember this very surreal moment of thinking, what in the heck have you done? Like, you... <laughs> you, you idiot um you've you've risked everything just for uh, a, a, a a silly dream a silly title a silly goal um you weren't smart about it um but my first ownership uh, my first year of ownership in Parigi um we grew the business 38% despite the recession wow nice. and uh, D magazine that year had nominated me as best up and coming chef um, so then I went right to the flip side of that thought, you risk-taking genius. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're a brilliant, brilliant man. <laughs> and you're too? How'd that turn out? Which one is it? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we continued to grow. Um, the subsequent year, two and three, I was nominated um, as Best Chef by D Magazine both years. Um, business continued to grow. We um, took on food service operations at the old Parkland um, and – uh, by all means, were very successful. Right at the beginning of year two, though, um, was when I had the opportunity to teach eight young men inside a Dallas County juvenile detention facility um, how to make ice cream for an ice cream competition at the Dallas Farmer's Market. And th uh, that singular event um, changed, uh, I mean, it, it changed my world. It changed everything. It changed my, my goals, my ambition, my focus, um, my self-perception, everything. So tell us about that competition a little more. Why 
did you make ice cream with these guys? I was on the board of um, the Dallas Farmers Market Friends, and we were putting together an ice cream competition, the Mama Ida's Ice Cream Social at the Farmers Market, um, to encourage folks to come down to the market. You know, have a nice uh, event that people could could rally behind. The idea was very simple. We were um, getting students from El Centro and the Art Institute um, to. Uh, make a gallon of ice cream, show up at the farmer's market. Uh, we would charge the public $5 to taste all the ice creams and vote on which one they liked the best. And we're going to give the winning um, student $100 and the rest of the money that uh, was accumulated um, we would use to help buy supplies for the, the staff at the farmer's market. Uh, and there was a gentleman on the board at that time, uh, a gentleman named Jerry Silhan, that um, ran a, a, an organization that um, did some uh, programming inside one of the, the juvenile detention facilities. And he just asked, you know, can I bring eight kids from one of the facilities to participate in this competition? And, uh, of course, everybody on the board said, oh, my gosh, it's like Philanthropy Squared. Yes. I mean, it's a great idea. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and his exact words were great. Now I just got to find somebody to teach him how to make ice cream. And everybody pointed at me like, oh, he'll do it. Uh, <laughs> and I, that uh, that I, I couldn't say no um, at that point. And, and so, you know, I showing up at the facility, I think um, I realized um, – the moment that I met these eight kids that I had stereotyped them before I had ever met them, mm. uh, the way they walk, the way they talk, thug, gangsta, hood, whatever stereotype you want to th- moniker you want to throw out there. Um, I realized I was wrong immediately. And I was embarrassed by that. Mm. Uh, I was really disappointed in myself. Um, these kids were so enthusiastic to learn um, and, and so excited to do something that they could just be proud of, to be able to do something positive and just be able to say, I did this. Um, and you're working with eight kids who, you know, we had, um, uh, produce, we had raspberries, strawberries, blueberries, blackberries, pineapple, cantaloupe, watermelon, honey. I mean, you name it, you know? Um, and for all of these kids, they'd never seen or tasted a fresh raspberry. Um, I, I, I still remember vividly that first year, a, a young Hispanic male that had never had fresh mango. And I just thought, oh my, like, that's a cultural heritage. I mean, my goodness. Um, and we made ice cream. I develop, I immediately developed a rule that was they had to use at least two fruits, uh, and at least one, uh, herb, um, because eating fresh tarragon to them was, was, uh, like I was forcing them to eat grass. Um, okay, I was like, but it's licorice taste. We'll have to pick this up after the break, but, uh, I want to, after break, we'll find out who won the competition and what the flavor was that you actually did. We'll be right back. <laughs> Stick around. Hi, this is Bob Gibbons with Riata Commercial Realty. If your office lease is going to be expiring in the next year or two, the one thing I would tell you you definitely do not want to do is exercise a renewal option. Now, that may sound a little nuts when you negotiate for that renewal option. Why wouldn't you actually want to use it? Well, the reason is because while you want to have one as a reservation for your space so the landlord can't lease the space out from under you, that option may not actually work the way you want it to now. It may have made sense five years ago, but it doesn't today. The only thing that changes when you exercise a renewal option are the expiration date and the rent. But you may want to do other things like have another option to renew, have an option to terminate or expand. You may want to be able to expand now or um, have a new base year for your operating expenses. There's all kinds of things that need to be considered. So we recommend that you renegotiate, not renew. For more information, contact me, Bob Gibbons, at texastenantrep.com. That's Texas TenantRep.com. We're back with Chad Hauser, founder, CEO, chef of Cafe Momentum. If you want to learn more about Cafe Momentum or Chad, please visit CZFE for Cafe. Oh. Uh, it's uh, I think it's a typo. CZ? That oh, should be Cafe Momentum. Cafe Momentum. That was a typo. <laughs> I was like, That's a really weird one. <laughs> Cafe Momentum. Org. Never give <laughs> anything with a typo on it to Stephen because it'll totally mess him up. <laughs> we, are, we are the nonprofit that wants to make it very difficult for you to donate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So before the break, you were telling us about the competition and yeah. really what changed things. So 
How did the competition turn out, and what was the flavor? Well, you know, uh, two days later, the, the the eight young men showed up, um, each of them making their own ice cream. They showed up at the farmer's market. They're standing so proud along these side these college culinary students. And at the end of the competition, one of the young men actually won the whole thing. His won flavor, it. He won it. He won it. Cantaloupe, yeah. strawberry, and basil. Oh, wow. That was his ice cream. Um, and when he won it, we he and I had this, like, incredible moment where he comes running up to me knees bent arms cocked and he's screaming in my face sir i just love to cook and i just screamed right back at him sir me too (laughs) um and he said um i just love to make food and give it to people and put a smile on their face and uh that just brought me you know struck me to my core it was um everything that i love about cooking i love i love cooking. I love putting food in front of people. I love, you know, the, the old Oscar Wilde quote that a wonderful meal um, can make anything tolerable, even family. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I've not heard that. That, that should have been the quote. Of the that been. <laughs> <laughs> a little more macabre, but yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, he said when he got out, he was going to get a job uh, in a restaurant and ask my professional opinion on whether he should work at Wendy's or Chili's. And, of course, I professionally told him whoever hires you first and then whoever pays you the most money second. Um, but I just – I drove home that day and I realized that he was never going to make it to a Wendy's or Chili's. It wasn't going to happen. As inspired, as motivated as he was, um, the deck was stacked against him. And it was stacked based on choices that were made for him um, before he was ever born. Um, such as where he lives? Or? Such as the color of his skin, um, the, where he lives. Uh, the socioeconomic class that he was born to, the schools that he has access to, the food resources that he has access to, the health care that he has access to. You know, all of these things determined um, his path in life. And then I self-reflectively thought, you know, I, I, I'm, uh, I, I'm part of that same um, system, but in the reverse side. You know, I, I was extended privilege um, for cho- by choices that were made for me before I was ever born. The color of my skin, um, the the family I was born to, the, the suburb I grew up in, the schools that I went to, um, you know, I growing up in a household where I, there was always food uh, in the pantry. I never had to worry about not eating. I never had to worry about going to school without showering because the water was turned off. I never had to worry about going to a school without textbooks because we always had the latest edition of, of every textbook. I never had to worry about um, riding buses and walking, you know, um, an hour and a half commute to get to school. Um, my parents dropped me off every day. You know, all of those things factored into um, my success, um, but they were all choices that, that were made for me before I was ever born. So you get this wonderful result from this competition, and you get this kid who's so anxious to do what you do for a living how do you take that idea that spark that whatever and turn it into what you have now um at that time i had no idea (laughs) (laughs) i just knew i wanted to do something um and so i you know i did the only thing that i could think to do which is just begin to immerse myself um in um the problem to figure out how to solve it um, and that meant working more with the kids, um, spending time at the facility, um, befriending the, the head of the juvenile department, uh, picking her brain constantly. Um, and, and it kept, uh, I kept hearing these constant themes of consistency and stability, um, that, that those are the two core things because the kids live in crisis constantly. So if you can provide a stable um, environment and be consistent, you know, do what you say, say what you do. If you say you're going to provide this, then provide it. If you say you're going to show up at a certain time, then you show up at a certain time. If you say you're going to do something, do it. And um, Sounds very simple. It, it does sound very simple, <laughs> right? But, but we live in such a complicated world. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, and going back to, remember, at that time, we're talking 2008, 2009, there was nothing simple about what was going on sure. in our country, in our, with our economy. Um, in the idea to create a consistent, stable environment um, that included work, that included all these things that were completely unstable in our country, was was very tricky. Um, um, but as I, you know, continued to kind of work through it, actually, uh, in full disclosure, was sitting at 
um, my restaurant uh, drinking whiskey at the end of the night. And we were <laughs> closing up the restaurant. I was on the phone with my business partner, uh, and I was just complaining to her that, you know, it had been a year. I hadn't done anything. I told these kids I was going to do something. Um, I, I was I was... I was not living up to my word, um, and she just kind of snapped at me uh, in a very sisterly way and just said, well, then what are you going to do? You know, like, shut up, <laughs> stop complaining. <laughs> yeah. And uh, again, I had been drinking whiskey, uh, and I just told her, I said, you know what, I just want to open a restaurant. I want to open up a restaurant and let these kids run it. And she immediately said, that's kind of not a bad idea. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, I know. <laughs> and we stayed up late um, just kind of talking about – this idea um, and bouncing ideas back and forth off of one another. And that was ultimately where the initial iteration of Cafe Momentum came about um, or the, ide- the the initial yeah idea. So the competition for the ice cream was in what year? Um, 2008. And this was 2009 okay. um, that finally had the idea for the restaurant because it took about a year. Very cool. And so what's the first step when you do that? Just run out and lease space? <laughs> create a menu? Well, <laughs> That's how all su- yeah. successful businesses start, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I mean, I am definitely a ready, fire, aim kind of guy. But <laughs> I didn't even have those big of kahunas. <laughs> um, uh, you know, the, the first thing for me was uh, to start to put together a business plan uh, to make it legitimate um, because you needed a business plan in order to – get money, right? Or, you know, at least approach people. You had to have some type of plan. Sure. Um, so start working on a business plan and then simultaneously start going around to people saying, you know, I want to open up a nonprofit restaurant. It, uh, it's going to be a 12-month paid post-release internship for juvenile offenders and, um, you know, but it's so much more than a restaurant. Um, you know, our restaurant, the kids work their way through every station in the restaurant um, over the course of 12 months so that they're learning life skills and social skills in the different environments, and different stations. They're also learning their strengths and interests and they're learning what it means to be a team player. Um, but in addition to, um, just the, 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 the job and what that brings, we also have an entire team of licensed clinical social workers, case managers, uh, and other individuals that work to build an ecosystem of support around the kids, um, addressing these crises issues like housing. 62% of the kids that we've worked with to date are homeless. If you're 15, 16 years old and you're homeless, that typically means you've also been abandoned. It means that you're showing up for work wondering where you're going to sleep at night. Um, You're not thinking about actually learning life skills. You're thinking about if you're going to be alive. Yeah, it's it's survival. And um, so, you know, we want to holistically address all these issues. Um, We have partnership with Parkland Hospital, so all of our kids not only have access to free health care, they have access to an actual primary care physician. We have multiple education partners so that we're getting kids who are on average two grade levels behind back in school and on track to graduate. Um, We have, um, obviously, housing partners. We have um, all of these, this ecosystem that we put together, but when you go to people and tell them that you're going to take kids out of jail and teach them about knives and fire, um, first thing they would say is, uh, well, you know, to say I want to open a nonprofit restaurant. They say, aren't all restaurants nonprofit? <laughs> um, <and> Eventually. <laughs> yeah. I have a friend that, um, is in the restaurant business and another friend of his wanted to get into it. And he said, do you want to make a little money in the restaurant business? He said, yeah. He said, great. Here's how you do it. You start with a lot of money and you'll be left with a little money. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, uh, then people would say things like, um, you know, what are you going to do when the kids stab each other in the kitchen? Uh, those kids don't want to work. They just want to collect a check. Uh, those kids have never been to a nice restaurant. Same type of lens maybe that you initially saw them with too, right? Uh, w- without question. And, and maybe even a little bit more, uh, intensified. And, um, that was, um, um, it was a huge mountain to climb. I mean, um, how do you break through those stereotypes? Um, uh, because the idea, what I'm pitching is that this is a group of kids that can and will rise to whatever level of expectation um, you set for them as long as you give them the tools and resources, guidance, support, opportunity to get there. And But you're speaking to a, a, a group of people that have the exact opposite um, thought. Yeah, um, they've already decided what the end result is. So why yeah. spend any time or money? Yeah. On it? Um, but in your in your business plan, you were talking about in starting this, 
<clears throat> was all of this part of that business plan? I mean, did you have that big vision of all these different agencies working together from the beginning? Um, not quite as intensive as what we are today. Um, but yeah, I mean, the idea to build the ecosystem of support around them absolutely was in the business plan that we were going to have case managers that we were going to pull it together. We didn't anticipate um, going into it um, the immense amount of, of needs and depravity of resources that the kids um, were lacking. And you don't because um, when your life is built on survival, mm -hmm. you're really good at hiding things. You're really good at keeping things private. Mm -hmm. um, and when you're working with kids once a month, um, it's very easy for them to do that. Um, they also don't develop um, a, a high level of trust with you at that point in time. But when the restaurant opened uh, and you're around them five, six, seven days a week, a lot of things get exposed, first of all. Um, but you also build a higher level of trust and, and they start to open up a lot more and tell you exactly what's going on in their lives. Um, and you realize that if you don't do anything, nobody ever will. Um, mm. So you have to. Interesting. I, you know, it's just overwhelming to me to think of the mission and all the different agencies that are necessary to be coordinated to make all this happen and to have that vision from the beginning. I, that, that's the part that's so daunting uh, it, it appears, but you've obviously done it. So I'm, I'm anxious to learn more about that and how somebody could replicate this a little later. But we got to take another break. You're listening to The Next Level on 1190 AM. Hi, my name is Fern, and I've been an Empowered Team member at Alkali for over five years. I first learned about Alkali through an online job board and was intrigued to learn that Alkali was a Dave Ramsey-endorsed local provider. But what captivated me was Alkali's mission statement, which is closely aligned with my own beliefs. So what's kept me at Alkali for over five years? First, Alkali's five core values match my own. Second, I've been empowered to use my unique abilities to impact our community, our clients, and Alkali. If you'd like to learn more about becoming an empowered Alkali team member, visit our website, alkaliservices.com. That's A-L-K-A-L-I services.com. Welcome back to the next level. We're here with Chad Hauser of Cafe Momentum, and you can find them on the air, on the air, on the web. You can find them on the air right now. <laughs> <laughs> and on the web at cafemomentum.org. Not CZFE Momentum. No, no, no don't. <laughs> Take mine, not, uh, not Stephen's word for where they're going to be found. All right, so we're, uh, we were talking about your beginnings and how you were coming up with your business plan and out trying to raise money. Tell us about the raising money part. How did that how did that go, and and what were you asking for? Well, uh, dollars. You know, it's <laughs> uh, I initially two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and I thought that was going to be a substantial amount of money per person um, or total. No total. Okay. Um, and you know, in hindsight, it took a million dollars to get the restaurant open. So I was a little bit off uh, <laughs> my, my math. Uh, but I realized that I had to break through the stereotype. I had to show the community that the kids were not who they thought they were. Um, and so, uh, in the spring of 2011 as myself and, and, uh, four other people working on, um, Cafe Momentum, um, and I threw out the idea of why don't we do, um, monthly pop-up dinners? Um, the idea of those underground dinners, pop-up dinners was kind of a new thing. Mm -hmm. It was just starting to take off. And I thought, why don't we catch a trend and it'll entice people to show up. It's new, it's different. Um, and then they'll have a wonderful experience. And at the end we'll be like, surprise, ah. you've been fed by juvenile offenders. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the, cause the idea was to go into one of the top restaurants in Dallas on a Sunday night when they're closed sell tickets to a private dinner, have the chef write a four-course menu, and then his or her staff to not only execute the food in the kitchen, but serve it to the level and quality of service of that restaurant where eight kids that we would bus in from a juvenile facility. Um, the first dinner was June 2011. Um, we had Jeffrey Hobbs, who was a chef partner at Sue's restaurant, um, and we had him cooking at the Milestone Culinary Center uh, over off of... Um, McKinney and, and Knox and um, it, you know it was funny uh, it took us 15 minutes to set off the fire alarms <laughs> um, <laughs> and you know what could go wrong um, but we we in building it out we honestly didn't think anybody would show up I mean it's pretty brazen to say come eat dinner we got this great chef but it's all juvenile offenders that are doing everything 
um, so much so that that I actually told the other four people, I said, look, each one of us has to sell 10 tickets to this dinner because the goal was to get 50 people to pay 50 bucks to show up. Um, I personally um, had devised a plan to call my mom and have her guilt the ladies in her Bible study class and to buy my 10 <laughs> tickets. Good plan. Um, yeah, right? <laughs> um, but, you know, myself and, and one of the other gentlemen um, – posted uh, a little, you know, write up about the dinner with a link to PayPal to buy tickets on our personal Facebook pages. And um, within 24 hours before we could turn the PayPal off, we had sold 68 seats. Wow. And um, that very first pop-up dinner, all 68 people, um, when they walked out of the door, they either shook my hand or they gave me a hug and they said, you know, this could be my son. And I realized immediately that the stereotype had been completely mm. eradicated. Um by December of 2011, got a little cocky, uh, doubled the price from $50 to 100 and an amazing thing happened. The dinner sold out in 15 minutes. Um, wow. And, you know, there is, a, there is a business philosophy about, you know, when you charge a higher price. Sure. Um, people, Exclusivity. Yep. Um, and uh, by spring of 2012, our dinners were selling out in, in 15 seconds. How often were um, you doing them? Once a month. Okay. Um, and... Uh, it was the summer of 2012 that I, I sat down with um, my business partner, and I, I think she knew what was coming, but um, I, I, I basically said um, that I needed, it was one thing to tell the kids that you believe in them, but it was another thing to, to actually prove it. And the only way that I knew how to prove it um, was to show them that I was willing to bet my career on them. Um, and so effective... Uh, September 1st, 2012, I uh, officially sold out of Perigi Restaurant um, and became the full-time uh, executive director and executive chef of Cafe Momentum, which was a restaurant and nonprofit that didn't exist. <laughs> we didn't even have our 501c3. We didn't have, wow. you know, so much. Um, and, and that was a, that was a, that was a, that in of itself was a very interesting uh, a period because uh, I looked at myself as kind of a risk taker. I mean, you know, selling your house, taking the equity, investing in a restaurant and so forth. But this was a whole um, different risk. But I knew that I would never forgive myself if I didn't do it. So whenever you decided to do that, had something fundamentally changed in the monthly dinners that told you monthly dinners weren't cutting it? Was it the fact that you weren't all in with the kids? Or was it that you just needed to have a platform to have a whole lot more kids in the program? Or what was that shift? What was that well, tipping point? Yeah, and I mean, even just the economics of it. I mean, the pop-up dinners themselves um, would net us about five thousand um, dollars per dinner. As I mentioned earlier, it took a million dollars to open the restaurant and get it up and running, and uh, like officially launch the program, the organization. Um, at five thousand dollars a dinner, it, it was going to take us twenty years to raise enough money to open the restaurant. Uh, and I realized that um, you know a bunch of volunteers can only do so much, but somebody needed to dedicate their full time to, to writing grants, to hustling around, raising money. Um, and <clears throat> as I just kind of walked through the process of, you know, well, if we need to find somebody to do that, why are you not looking at yourself? Why are you not thinking to do it? Yeah. Why are you not going to put skin in the game? And that was it for me. So you're all in and, you know, you're building the program. And was it, was it, quickly successful or what was there you know i mean what were some of the challenges early on to getting it up to scale well the, the, not, not you, that you, i mean it sounds like you guys are trying to go to another level now but yeah um the um you know i i mean i became executive director uh in september 1st 2012 the restaurant didn't even open until january 29th 2015 so there was still so much um, wow. that had to be done um you're essentially building two businesses um in one, right? Because the nonprofit side, the support services um, uh, that you're providing, you're building out all of that. You're creating all of those partnerships um, and and building out that ecosystem. But at the same time, then you're building a restaurant, mm -hmm. um, and so you're going through the design, the, the physical design of the restaurant, um, picking out the location of the restaurant. Um, working on the financials of the restaurant and how that structure looks um, to hire, hiring um, multiple teams, right? Um, you have a team that's running the restaurant. You've got a team that's overseeing um, 
that kind of uh, clinical services side um, and, and figuring out how do they coexist, how do they communicate, uh, how do they effectively um, support one another. Um, and, and, and honestly, you're really uh, um, kind of making it up as you go along because there, there, wasn't, there, there was no playbook that I could reference that said, oh, this is exactly how you do it. Right. Um, a, a good friend of mine is a gentleman, Robert Egger, um, who founded DC Central Kitchen in Washington, DC, which is a, a wonderful organization that just celebrated, I think, their 25th or 30th anniversary. And now he's in Los Angeles building, uh, running, uh, uh, building an, an organization called LA Kitchen. Um, and um, uh, I had, again, like that, that whole Dale Hansen thing, I just had the courage to email him. I didn't have to write him a letter this time. <laughs> um, but, uh, just saying, Hey, can I, can I meet you? Can we talk? And, um, did he take you to Hooters? Uh, yeah, <laughs> 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 that would have been really symbolic. <laughs> <laughs> you <arrived. laughs> He, um, and, and, and we had a wonderful, uh, I went to LA and I spent several hours with him just talking to him. We had a great conversation. He was, uh, such an incredible resource guide, mentor, you name it. Um, and at the end of the conversation, I just said, you know, um, if there's anything I could ever do for you, I'll come peel potatoes. I don't care. I'm, I'm, I'm indebted to you. And he said, you're young, brash, and making it up as you go along. And that's very inspiring to an old fart like me. <laughs> uh, and I remember that was so validating to me um, that it was okay. Um, that it was okay to live, you know, that the world didn't have to be black and white. I could live in a gray area um, as long as I just had confidence in myself and my team. Um, that was all that mattered. That's awesome. So his his uh, kitchen, are they also doing a similar kind of thing where they're using? They, um, they work predominantly with adult populations. Um, okay. So D.C. Central Kitchen um, focuses on um, working with um, – individuals that are coming out of incarceration or drug addiction or homelessness, gotcha. um, adults, um, and providing um, employment training for them. LA Kitchen does something very similar, um, but they actually um, are um, heavily focused on providing uh, similar to like a Meals on Wheels, providing meals for seniors because uh, Robert, just being a visionary and a genius, realized that, you know, the baby boomers, with the exception of millennials, are the the, the biggest, largest, oldest generation, or the biggest generation uh, we we currently have alive today, and they're all going into um, senior citizen status, and they're going to need that type of support, but they all have um, very specific dietary needs and dietary restrictions, and nobody's focused on addressing that, so their program actually uh, is a training facility, um, a jobs training facility, but they're they're training them, they're preparing food to be delivered Meals on Wheels style wow. um, for seniors in and around L.A. Interesting. My 80-year-old mother delivers many Meals on Wheels. Uh, she <laughs> did it yesterday. <laughs> she loves it. Um, so whenever you're putting all these services together, the, the hardest thing to me seems to be to, to envision is getting all these governmental entities to play ball with something that doesn't quite exist yet. And we've only got about 45 seconds, but – was that not just like beating your head against the wall? <laughs> I don't think I could summarize that in 45 <laughs> seconds. <laughs> How yes. is the Great Wall of China? Built? <laughs> Give me a brick by brick account. Well, of we can continue the on the other side. <laughs> Deal. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, we are going to take another break. Um, we're going to do it a little early, actually, Stephen. But we'll be back in just oh a minute, gosh. and we'll uh, pick it up then. Stick around. Hi, my name is Michael Patton. I'm the founder and CEO of Fetch. We solve last mile package delivery for apartment buildings. We're always happy to deliver earplugs to anybody who has to listen to Bob and Steven. Welcome back to the next level, Conversations That Propel Business. We're here with Chad Hauser from Cafe Momentum, and you can learn more at cafemomentum.com. Dot org. Dot org. Thank you. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So Bob asked a really intriguing question. That I'm sure everyone's dying to hear is they want to hear about your experience with the government <laughs> and how you got them to go in line. So, um, hi, I'm from the government. And I'm here to help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even worse, you were the going to them. So I need your help. Yeah, I need your help. Um, uh, you know, um, I, I have to tell you, um, Dr. Terry Smith, who recently retired as the executive director of the juvenile department, um, 
obviously exhibits a high level of risk tolerance as well because um, she literally said, how can I help? Wow. Um, and um, I mean, to have um, carte blanche access to her, direct access to her um, and, and whatever we needed. I mean, there's there's parameters and, and rules in which we all had to observe and, and operate under. Um, but the idea that she would immediately support taking eight kids every month out of a facility, busing them to a restaurant and allowing them to work in that restaurant, um, obviously under supervision, but um, that, that's, that's, that, it's outside that the some box. big cojones. Yeah, yeah, definitely outside the box. But, um, you know, she, she saw um, what we were doing was, was completely um, thinking outside the box and the idea that um, we were providing support once the kids got released and go right back to the same house, same street, same neighborhood, same poverty, school, you name it, mm -hmm. um, to provide that um, level of support just wasn't existent um, at that time. So it sounds to me like you know the, the thing you did was you approached them not as the government, but as individuals that happen to be working for a governmental entity. So you get that connection, and then it's a whole different ballgame, and they're willing to help. Exactly, exactly. Very willing cool. to help. So I understand that, uh, you know, we talked about funding a little bit and how you went out and looking for, for funding. Uh, so you're open, the, the, the restaurant's doing well, there's a lot of people showing up. Um, how much of that budget comes from the people that actually come in there and eat? Well, there's a, there is a, a, a um, false uh, idea that the restaurant funds everything. Um, mm -hmm. I don't even think the biggest, most successful restaurant in the world could fund our entire programming. Um, the restaurant itself, we are, um, it, it accounts f uh, for about 30% of our overall operating budget, the revenue from the restaurant. Wow. Um, the other 70% is made up in um, in going out in good old fashioned fundraising. Um, everything from, um, you know, we do a, a monthly uh, concert series with Eric Nadell from the Texas Rangers that helps raise money and bring in new donors um, to our Momentum Society, which is an annual uh, giving platform that starts at the $5,000 level to writing copious amounts of grants to foundations locally and nationally um, to continue to raise money. What's your total budget requirement uh, year, every year? Our, our budget right now is $2.6 million. Okay. Uh, and so... Um, it's, uh, and, and growing bigger. <laughs> so if somebody wants to donate after hearing this, they can just go to your website, go to cafe momentum.org. And there is a beautiful, bright donate button on the top of the <laughs> web page. Now, the other thing I thought was cool is that <clears throat> whenever I had dinner there, I, I had dinner there on a Friday night with my wife and my son and his girlfriend and on the menu or, or maybe it was, yeah, I guess it was on the menu. So there was all the stuff I could order to eat, but then there was also, contribution levels donations mm -hmm. so you can just add that to your to your uh, ticket so to speak right there well one of the things you know um we've been very fortunate and the restaurant has continued to get rave reviews uh eater dallas has us ranked number three currently wow. in their list of the 38 top restaurants in dallas and wow. um with that uh it brings in a lot of people that are coming in because they think it's a hot restaurant they have no idea uh, the social component that's attached to it. Oh, wow. Um, and, you know, when you dine at the restaurant uh, in lieu of a gratuity, you leave a donation. Um, so the, the line that typically says gratuity on your receipt says donation, yeah. um, which to me is kind of advantageous. There's only a restaurant in Dallas where you can actually get a tax write-off uh, just for going out to dinner because <laughs> your gratuity is an actual donation. Um but it became incumbent upon us that we needed to begin educating our customers as far as 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 what the restaurant does um and it's important that they understand where their money is going um as is with any nonprofit, you need to be transparent about the work that you're doing mm -hmm. um and where your money's going so um you know what you're referring to is we're talking about you know this much money helps pay for the kids to eat every week this is pays for their uniforms this is how much it costs to so that it is a reminder to people that we are doing a lot more than than just providing a job that we are building this ecosystem and, and that it takes a lot of uh, effort and a lot and a lot of money um, as a result uh, one of the things that we like to focus on is that you um, as a donor are getting a return on investment for um, helping support this ecosystem that you're getting a, an actual return um, so we started studying um, from the very first pop-up dinner to, to current day uh, we started 
studying recidivism. Recidivism is a fancy word that means reincarceration. Mm-hmm. Um, in the state of Texas, 48.3% of the kids that go to jail once will be back within 12 months. Wow. Um, put another way, and maybe a little more succinct, half the kids that go to jail in this state will be back in less than a year. Um, and um, in in our state, uh, it costs to incarcerate, right? I mean, sure. <clears throat> whether you're a child or adult, um, and the cost is absorbed by us, the taxpayers, mm-hmm. uh, by our guests in the restaurant. And <clears throat> um, that cost in, in Texas is $127,000. So you can imagine as an investment, um, we as taxpayers are investing $127,000 mm-hmm. um, to incarcerate a kid with a 50-50 chance that we're going to spend another $127,000 in less than a year <laughs> to put them back in jail, uh, not the correct path. Uh, and if they go back a second time, um, data will tell you, but common sense will tell you, it's done. Yep. It's over. They're going to spend the rest of their life going in and out. And that, uh, I can't find state numbers on that, but nationally it's a, there was a study done that says it's about a $1.7 to $2.3 million lifetime cost um, to incarcerate. And that doesn't include the cost to perpetuate the cycle because it is a cycle. Yep. Um, and, and it doesn't include victim costs. And it doesn't include, you know, all of these uh, ancillary but important costs. Um, So um, we studied recidivism um, with the uh, 500 kids that we've worked with from first pop-up to date, uh, and only 15.2% have ever gone back to jail at all. So my running joke with Mayor Mike Rawlings is that he owes me $19.8 million (laughs) 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 because that's how much money we've saved taxpayers. Um, But that's important for people to know, you know, because when I'm asking you to invest, essentially, uh, in our organization and invest in the long-term success of the kids, I need to show you a baseline return on investment. Um, I just uh, completed a, a program through BBVA Compass Bank uh, and the Macomb School of Business at uh, UT Austin. Um, and the first uh, homework that they gave me was to do a social return on investment uh, template for uh Cafe Momentum, and the, the return on investment on money that we've taken in is to um, oppose, uh, compared to taxpayer savings with a 747% return on investment. Oh, wow, my. That's um, entrepreneurial right there. <laughs> that's that's awesome. not bad. <laughs> it's amazing. So the question, though, like, I mean, you're having an amazing impact. So what's the – how does the model scale? I mean, can, can you take it to higher and higher levels? I mean – Oh yeah, the the goal all along has been to uh, scale. Um, you know, I m- my um, I, I flippantly um, was quoted in an interview about a year ago saying that I wanted to open up um, more cafe momentum's and Starbucks. Um, I subsequently had the good fortune to meet Howard Schultz um, and <laughs> wow. was named a Starbucks upstander and um, found out that. Um, there are 27,000 Starbucks across the <laughs> world. Um, fun fact, in China, they open a Starbucks every 15.8 hours. Wow. Um, and I, so I, I, I've, I've tethered that down a bit. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of looking at a local coffee franchise <laughs> first <laughs> and saying I want as many as them. Um, no, the goal has always been to scale. I mean, um, there are 65,000 kids that enter the juvenile system in the state of Texas every year. Um, and this isn't a problem that's even um, exclusive to our state. Um, you sure. meet so many people around the country and they say, you know, we need one of these and in, in our city or our town, and, and they're, they'll tell you um, story after story after story after story um, that resonate, to, you know, similar to stories that, that, that I see every day with, with, with my kids. Um, so the need is there, and we definitely want to build it to scale. We spent all of last year transitioning the organization from, from startup into more traditional operations. Mm-hmm. Um, trying to put the finishing touches on that. And, and the goal um, right now is to open up um, the second Cafe Momentum uh, by the end of next year. So wow. knock on wood. <laughs> Do you have Still a location? Can we, uh, I, I always say that's the million-dollar question, yeah. literally and figuratively. Yeah. Depends who wants to write the million-dollar check. Wake <laughs> yeah. right? yeah. up. area, though, still? <laughs> uh, I don't even know the answer to that question. Okay. You know, there's so many factors that go into it. Um, you, you know, when – if you're – Growing uh, as an entrepreneur, when you're building a business and when you're looking at expanding that business, there's there's factors that um, extend um, 
beyond just the funding, right? I mean, sure. um, you have to look at a multitude of factors. We don't want to um, dilute a market. You don't yeah. want to, you also, sometimes you got to strike while the iron's hot and, and go ahead and hit into a new market um, so that you can um, kind of, uh, what do they say, when lightning strikes twice, you know, like you can um, hit that with a bunch of enthusiasm too. And, sure. and so there's, there's so many factors. Um, we're starting to do some scenario planning right now. Um, that kind of encompass all of those factors and looking at, you know, where we do want to go. So we have about a minute left. Can you put a face to this? Give us a success story of an individual that's gone through your program. Um, I'll tell you very quickly about a young man that graduated um, in our very first graduating class at Cafe Momentum. Um, he uh, uh, co had committed crime um, to, to access money um, because money would allow him resources like shoes, um, food, and um, went through our program, graduated our program, went to work at the Hilton Anatole, who's one of our employment partners. Um, within three months of graduating our, uh, within three months of working at the Anatole, um, he was promoted from busboy to barback and at 17 years old was making between $700 and $1,000 a week with full health benefits, paid vacation, a 401k. Awesome. Last January, uh, <clears throat> he became the first ever high school graduate of his family. And uh, last week, he finished up his first year as a freshman at Richland College. Awesome. That That's is awesome. So, so exciting. Well, thank you so much for being our guest today. Thank we you. really, really enjoyed it. Uh, go to cafemomentum.org, listeners. Please donate. Please go to the cafe and eat. Please come to see us. We're open Thursday, Friday, Saturday for dinner. And uh, we'll be back next week with another great guest. Spread the word. Have a great week.